Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to mini lecture number two with your host, Jess Verisma. Today, we're going to be talking about Bash, the born again shell. Um, I'm going to give you some tips for how to use it, and uh, hopefully, it'll be useful to you. We'll start with some self check questions. And again, I encourage you guys to pause this and uh, think through each of these. Um, otherwise, I will go ahead and move on. Okay, so we'll be looking at how to navigate Bash, some common commands that'll help you get around. Uh, we'll look at some Bash files and IO redirection, and then we'll look at some files that are used by Bash. Okay, so first we're going to be uh, learning how to navigate Bash a little bit more uh, clearly. For each of these, I would encourage you to pull up a terminal um, on your own computer and take time trying each of the commands that I teach you. Um, Let's start with some helpful commands. The first one is clear, which just clears the terminal screen and brings you back to an empty prop at the top of the screen. Next is history. If you want to know some of the commands that you've typed recently, you can um, type history and it'll output a whole bunch of them. You can also access uh, some of the commands in your history by pressing the up arrow a bunch of times. You can do that to, you know, say uh, the third to last command that you entered, you can type up three times, press enter, and it'll repeat that command. Next, there's alias. Now, say you want to, um, to make a shortcut, a uh, shorthand for another command. You can do that using the alias command. So the example I have here is alias C equals clear. So say instead of typing clear every time you want to clear the screen, you just want to type C. So C, enter. That'll clear the screen if you've typed in alias C equals clear. So this is just telling Bash C is a shortcut. So in this slide, you can see some of the example history from one of my uh, Bash sessions on another computer. It's one that I use for some of my doctoral research. Um, so here I'm going and checking out some of the code and some of my different simulations and looking at the differences between one version and another version and yeah, got messy. But here you can see that there's numbers on the left hand side and then there's a command. So for instance, on line um, 18789, I use clear. Uh, on the next line, line 18790, I use the diff command to look at one file called input and compare that file to this other one, input no jet really in some other directory. Um, and so that's an example of what uh, kind of history you'll get if you use the bash command history. Bash also has a number of auto completion features that make, here there's some keyboard shortcuts in bash that are really, really helpful. You can use the up and down arrows to browse the commands that you've already entered. Definitely recommend if you aren't doing this, try pausing this video, give it a shot on your own, and uh, see if you can do this. If you can't, send me an email. Now say you've typed a long command and you realize, actually, I don't want to type this command. This is a bad command. It might do bad things to my system. Rather than pressing delete a whole bunch of times to delete the entire line, you can just type control C. And then you'll have a blank line. Um, it'll forget what you did. And that can be really useful. Say you typed a really long line, but then you want to go back and change the command in the very, very beginning of the line. You can use the left arrow to go back through all of the command, or you can simply type Control A. If you type Control A, the cursor will go back to the beginning of the line. If you type Control E, the cursor will go to the end of the line. This can be very, very handy when you have a longer command. You can also type Control R. Control R will then expect you to type in a command that you want to search for. Not necessarily just a command, it could be a file that you've searched for, but it will search all of your history for a line uh, or command that you've entered, um, and it will try to, um, to match that. So then if you type Control R again, it'll search for a different one. If you type uh, Control R again after that, it'll basically keep going through all of your history, trying to find the most recent um, uh, command that matches the stuff that you've entered, the text that you've entered at the bottom of the screen. There are also some special bash commands. This command, if you type exclamation point and then the command that you want to run, 
it will rerun the most recent command that you've entered that starts with whatever you've typed. So for instance, if I type exclamation GC, it will probably rerun the most recent time I used GCC. And so whatever command I used for that, um, it'll copy that whole entire line and it will re-enter that line. This is dangerous if you use uh, exclamation point RM, which means remove, because it will remove whatever you removed before, but it might not necessarily remove the same file, it'll just issue the same command, which can have devastating consequences. I speak from personal experience. Devastating consequences. Be careful with that. Next, <laughs> um, you can do exclamation point n, where n is one of those numbers from your history file. Remember, if you type history, you'll get a list of um, numbers and, well, you get a list of commands in your history, and then there'll be a number next to them. Which, you know, command was it? Was it the 500th command that you've entered in bash or the 10,000th one? So if you type exclamation point that number, it'll select that line from your bash history and repeat it exactly. It's, a, it's basically a shortcut for you typing it all in yourself. And if you want to be even shorter, you can type in exclamation point, exclamation point. That'll rerun exactly the very last command that you entered. It's the same as if you had pressed up to get to the last command and then enter to enter that command. So these things can be very helpful too, as you're using bash. Let's go back and revisit bash history. Now again, bash is keeping track of the commands that you enter because it wants to help you if you want to be able to get back to them faster. So we talked about the history command. Now by default, the history command will print the last 500 lines of your bash history. You can increase that if you want by changing the dollar sign hist size environment variable. We'll talk more about environment variables later. But it's controlled by these different settings. It's a variable that's used by bash. All of the commands that you enter are stored in a file called .bash underscore history, which is stored in your home directory. So tilde slash .bash underscore history. Those aren't actually stored when you enter the command. They're stored when you close a bash session. So as long as you have the bash session open, it's going to be keeping those commands in memory, and it's not going to be outputting them to this file until you exit that session, when you close the window, say. And the number of lines that get saved in that file is controlled by another environment variable called hist file size. I set it to 50,000 so I can keep track of the last 50,000 commands I've done in bash, because um, hopefully um, that'll be enough. If you want to know more about how exactly it works, what controls it, here's a link. Um, I don't recommend spending your time there, but if you want to, there it is. So let's also revisit uh, bash input and output and redirection. We talked briefly about this before on uh, our lecture slides for day 12, but I'd like to revisit it. This is the part that will be a little bit of review, hopefully. So when we talk about IO redirection, we have a couple operators. The first is the greater than operator. Now normally you'll have a command before that and then a file after that. The command before that presumably will have some output and then that output will be redirected. So instead of showing up on the command line, it will instead be redirected um, to the file that's specified. So in this example, I have a program called my program and I am taking any output from that program and putting it into a new file called output.txt. And again, if that file exists already, it will be replaced which might be what I want, or maybe it's not, and I better be careful. If instead of replacing the file, I want to just append to the end of that file, what I can do is I can use two greater than signs. So this is the double, um, this is the ap appending operator. So what this will do is it's just the same as the previous one, except now if the file already exists, it will append to, that, to the end of that file with all the output from my program rather than overwriting whatever was there before. Next, we have the less than operator. So this right here will basically work in reverse. So there should, uh, it'll take the contents of a specified file as standard input for the given command. So if I have a program called my program and I have an input file called input.txt, then if my program searches or is at looking for standard input, you know, usually from the keyboard, 
before it looks to the keyboard for any input, it will first grab all of the input that it can from input.txt. Now, if my program is still looking for input and it's gotten to the end of input.txt, it'll then go and start reading from the keyboard. So that, those are the basic ones. There's one other uh, redirection operator that's really powerful too, and this is perhaps the most well-used one. This is the pipe operator. So what the pipe operator does is it takes standard output from one command and uses it as standard input for another command. So let's see an example of this. In this example, I'm using the history command, which as you'll remember, will output all of my recently used commands to the command line as standard output. And then I have the pipe operator. And then I have some command called grep. Now what grep does is it searches the, um, it searches standard out or it searches standard input for um, a line that matches whatever you give it. So in this case, history is going to give a whole bunch of different lines of all my different commands in my history, and then it will send them all to grep. Then what grep will do is it will search all of those lines for GCC. And if there's any line that has GCC, it will output them. So in summary, History outputs all of your bash, my bash history to standard out. Grep takes that, or the pipe operator takes that standard out and makes it as the standard input for grep. Grep will search standard input all of the lines, looking for a line that has that contains the words or the letters GCC in that order. So basically, what this command here is doing is it's looking, it's searching all of my history for commands or times that I've used the command GCC. Kind of cool. Now, in addition to using output.txt or other text files that you specify, you can redirect input and output to standard error and standard out. So if we do this, we will use something called file descriptors in Bash. Now, um, this is kind of like a pointer almost. Um, and so standard out is represented by the file descriptor one and standard error is represented by the file descriptor two in Bash. So if I have one greater than, that's going to redirect file descriptor one, i.e. standard output, and then it will send it wherever you tell it to go, like we had before with a greater than symbol. So in this example here, we have my program, um, which maybe will produce standard output and standard error, why not? But what will happen is it will redirect standard output one greater than to a file output.txt. Any standard error that that program produces will go to the screen as usual. We can also redirect just standard error. So if we do two greater than, then what we could have is my program two greater than errors.txt. And what will happen is any standard output from my program will then go to the screen as usual, but any standard error will be redirected into a file called errors.txt, and it won't go to the screen. I also have the following two operators, which are syntactically identical. Um, why it's why do they have two instead of one? I don't know, but they do. So if you have these two operators, it will redirect both standard output and standard error to the same destination. So here, my program ampersand greater than all output that text will redirect both standard output and standard error to a file called out, all output dot text. This is effectively what's happening when they both get sent to the same screen to be displayed to you. Not exactly, but effectively kind of the same. You can also redirect the streams to point to each other or even other file descriptors. So if you have um, two greater than ampersand one, the two represents again standard error and the one represents standard output. Now you can't just do two greater than one because that will redirect two, uh, file descriptor two not into file descriptor one, but it will redirect it into a new text file named one. So you need to have the ampersand there so that you don't send it to a text file named one. Instead, it sends it to the file descriptor pointed to by file descriptor one. So two greater than ampersand one will redirect all of standard error into standard output. So this will effectively combine the streams so that they both look like they're coming from standard output instead of standard error. So in the example here, my program two greater than ampersand one, all output dot text is going to combine, it's going to redirect all of standard error into standard output. 
and they'll both get sent to all output.txt. So it's almost the same as the line before. You could also reverse that. So you had one greater than ampersand two and then all output.txt. And then that would convert all of, uh, or it would redirect all of standard output into standard error. And then it would redirect both of them into this thing, all output.txt. So what files are used by bash in order to store settings and, and defaults and, and so on? Now there's a really good introduction in this first link. Uh, link. Uh, I recommend you check it out. Um, there's another uh, in the second link. Now the second one has my Mac OS X um, in the URL, but it is not necessarily specific just to Macs. Um, if you want to understand a little bit more about this, um, it, it'll be useful for people who are interested in Unix or Linux as well. Now before we get into the different kinds of files used by Bash, I want to quick talk a little bit about what style Bash will start up in. For instance, will it start up as a login shell, or will Bash be running as a non-login shell? Now a login shell is when you log into the terminal, when you open up the command line in a new window on your Mac or Linux system, or when you log in via SSH, via PuTTY. Basically when you open up a new terminal and you start uh, at that new terminal and you run Bash from it, that's a login shell session. Now it's a non-login shell, shell, <laughs> shell session when you start Bash from an existing terminal. So say that you've um, SSH to the thing servers and uh, that was your login shell. And then from within that shell, you start another instance of Bash. So Bash is running itself. It's a shell within a shell. And when you do that, it doesn't have to log in again because it's already logged in with the first shell. So this would be an example of a non-login shell, se shell session. Now this is kind of a little bit of an advanced topic, so I don't think you need to know this too detailed but I'm gonna mention it a little bit later, so I wanted to quickly briefly, quickly briefly address it, if I can talk clearly. <laughs> we also have interactive shell sessions and non-interactive shell sessions, and tongue twisters, evidently. So an interactive shell session is when you have commands that are read in from the keyboard. So uh, this is the case whenever you uh, log in on a terminal um, on your own, if you log in via SSH, or when you type bash to start a shell within a shell. So in an interactive shell session, it's always reading from the keyboard uh, for standard in, and then also output is usually printed to your terminal. That's ignoring all of this um, input output redirection stuff. Um, that can still be happening within an interactive shell. In a non-interactive shell session, to, uh, commands are, giving, uh, are being given to bash some other way. So for example, if you run a shell script, which we'll talk about later, then bash is going to be reading the commands not from the keyboard, but from some script file, which is a, a list of instructions. It's like a, a mini program, if you will. So there it's not interactive because you can't really, uh, you can't give the different commands, you can't check what the different variables are at any given point. Um, it's just running on, all on its own in a new instance of bash. And that instance of bash will be not interactive. So a given shell session can either be log a login or non-login, and it can be either interactive or non-interactive. So you could be a login non-interactive shell. You could be a non-login interactive shell. Typically, when you start a session for the first time, you'll be in a login and an interactive shell. But there are other versions there, and if you want to know more about that, again, it's a little more advanced, don't require it. But if you're interested, here's a link to, that explains it better. So again, most of the time for now, we're just gonna be doing a login and an interactive shell. Now, when bash starts, it's going to be running uh, and looking at a couple different files. And what I'm gonna be telling you here is really simplified. Um, and I can do 98% of what I need to do using just these two files um, or three files. I'll mention a third one. Um, you don't need to use these if you don't want, but they're good to know about because they can make your life uh, a lot easier when you use bash. The first one is tilde dot bash profile or simply dot bash profile, which is stored in your home directory, the tilde. The second one is dot bash RC. What are they? What's the difference? These are both startup files. 
That bash profile is run, it's a script, a bash script. So it's a set of bash instructions that you could type out on your own if you wanted to. But all those instructions are stored in this file and they're run together the first time that you open up a terminal. So this is used usually for setting aliases, setting environment variables that apply to your whole session, and several other things. A lot of times people will add to the end of your bash profile file a command to run bash rc, which has some other things in it. But basically it's something that you would put in a login shell. Dot bash rc is oftentimes where you'll put other aliases, you'll put function definitions, shell options, um, other customizations that you like, you know, maybe different colored text or something. That's where you'll put stuff in your bash RC. But that's the kind of thing that you'll put in your bash RC. When you ever you go to a new machine for the first time, so for instance, uh, on a, uh, you've got a nice bash RC file on the thing servers, but now you work for a new company as, an in, as part of an internship. And they say, hey, you need to SSH to our mainframe. And we'll be running bash on that mainframe. And you're like, goody, I know that. You can copy your bash RC file from the thing servers to your new company's computers, assuming they're okay with that. And then uh, your bash sessions on your new computer will look and feel just like they do on the thing servers. That can make a lot of things easy. So what goes where? You can put stuff in your bash stuff. You can put stuff in your bash RC file that will work on any computer that runs bash. And that's great because again, if you go to a new computer, you can just copy your .bash RC file, and then as soon as you're on that new computer, things will feel very similar to when you were on your old computer. So here's a short example of a bash profile uh, script. Now this is an example of a bash script. So each one of these lines here represents a bash command. The pound signs for many of these lines are comments. So the first line here, the pound sign note, is a comment, and so is the next line. So here I'm echoing a command running dot bash profile. Yay, I want to know what script I'm running. And then I export something, um, something called path. It's a, a variable. We'll get into that later. I'm exporting some other variables here. And then at the very, very end, it says, if it exists, run the dot bash RC script. And so I have this new command here. It says, if uh, the bash RC file exists, that's what the dash F means, then dot means execute, so execute tilde slash dot bash rc. So if this exists, run the script called dot bash rc, and if. Don't worry about the exact syntax, you don't need to know that now. So let's see what the bash rc would be. Again, this is going to be um, uh, run hopefully when you run your bash profile, um, but it's not necessarily guaranteed to run otherwise. So this one at the very top, it'll echo running dot bash rc, yay. It'll mess with some things. It'll export CLI color equals one. That's a setting that tells um, me to have colored output when I run the command ls. Um, there's some other variables here related to history. Uh, I export a variable called editor <clears throat> and I set that value equal to slash user slash bin slash vim. So some applications will read this environment variable called editor, and they will try to figure out uh, what, what editor I like. And so if that program wants me to edit a file, it'll use my favorite editor, which for me happens to be Vim. And then at the end of this, I actually say if a file called bash aliases exists, then run that file. So let's see what that is. This is a non-standard bash script but it's one that some people use in order to store all of their bash aliases to just organize it better. So here's a bunch of different aliases that I have created. So for instance, the second one is uh, beep. So if I type in beep on my command line after this has been run, then it will make an audible beep, which is kind of fun. And then there's some other ones that I can use that are kind of fun. Um, if you wanna see some cool bash aliases, if you wanna play around with that, I encourage you to check out this uh, link at the bottom. So those are some of the files that bash will use. It'll open up .bash profile when you do a login script and it will do bash RC um, if you do an interactive script. Um, and it's helpful sometimes to call 
dot bash pro or dash dot bash rc from your dot bash profile. It's not necessary. If you want to play around with all, any of these three files, go for it. It's not necessary, but it can make uh, your experience with bash a lot easier. Um, it can make it more pretty. It can make it more friendly. Um, it can make it feel a lot less uh, intimidating or foreign. Finally, if you want some um, some more walkthroughs to really own this command line stuff and understand Bash better, um, here are some walkthroughs. Um, if you're interested in learning how to use it um, better, um, I encourage you to check out one of those and just skim it, maybe two or three of them even. And then finally, I'd like to give you a quick practice problem. So uh, if you if you are up to the challenge, try making it so that Bash prints Hello World every time you log in. There have been a couple clues as to how to do this um, in the earlier slides, um, but see if you can figure it out. Use help files online, um, use what you've seen in this lecture, um, or go to the next slide and see some of the hints. But I'd encourage you to not to go there yet, but to pause right now and challenge yourself to try it on your own. Okay, so either you didn't pause or you're ready for some hints. Either way, I'm about to give them to you. Again, I'd encourage you to pause and try it on your own just for practice. But if not, here we go. Hint number one. What command, if you were just typing a single command into bash, what one command would output hello world to the screen? I'd encourage you to pause now again and see if you can figure that out before I go on to the next clue. Three, two, one. Okay, clue number two. Whatever command you have for that first hint that's going to output hello world to the screen, take that command and put it in your bash profile or your bash rc file. If you do that, then try logging out or closing the terminal window and then reopen the terminal window and see if it indeed printed out hello world to the screen. Now, if you put it into bash profile, it should get run as soon as you open up a new terminal with bash in say the thing servers. If you do it in your bash RC file, it might not necessarily run it. If that's the case, you may need to source or to run your bash RC file from within your bash profile. And you can find on a previous slide how to run that in the example bash profile slide. Now, in any event, if you keep an echo statement in your bash rc file, an output statement, one that prints stuff to the screen, it can actually cause SCP to stop working correctly. So if you do this, you might not want to keep it there for long term. Anyway, uh, that's all for today. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Take care. Jess out.